Our Father, we bow before you here in this place, and we just praise your holy name. Thank you for the incredible opportunity of being able to worship you through music this morning, for reminding us of just how beautiful and how wonderful and how powerful you are, reminding us this morning of how much we need you every single moment of every single day and how with you it can be well with our soul. So, Father, we come before you continuing to bless your name now as we open up your word and we study your scripture. And, Lord, we pray this morning that as we open your word that you will open our eyes to see wondrous things from this law. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles today, I want to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. We'll be looking at verse 12 all the way through the end of the chapter, continuing our sermon series entitled Bigger Than You. And the message that we're continually trying to help you understand is that God's purpose for your life is way bigger than you. He didn't save you just so that you could go to heaven when you die. But God saved you because He desires to reveal His incredible name through you. And when you are saved, God calls you to be a part of a local body of believers. One of the things that we've continued to see in the text is it says when people believed, they were added to the number, meaning that they were called to be a part of a body of believers. And God has a purpose for the church that is bigger than us. Just as He desires to reveal His name through us as individual believers, God also desires to reveal His name through the church. Remember, Paul told us that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Well, what exactly has become new? He tells us in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ, and therefore it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So what's new is that now we have Christ living in us. And what does Christ living in us help us do? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. Paul would tell us in Philippians chapter 2 that it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So the difference in your life as a Christian is now you have God living in you through the person of the Holy Spirit whose purpose it is to glorify the Father through us as individuals and also through us as a church. Now, if I were to ask you this morning, if I were to say who in here would call themselves a Christian, I'm pretty confident that most of you would raise up your hands. But I want to ask you a deeper question than that. So listen to me here. Would you call yourself a nominal Christian or an authentic Christian? Nominal means in name only. Do you realize that a person can be brought up in the church with the most incredible of Christian parents and grandparents? A person can come through children's ministry and youth ministry and be involved in Sunday school and be involved in discipleship training and be involved in Bible drill and disciple nows and fifth quarters and can be involved in university ministry and campus ministries and even as an adult continue to be in church every single Sunday and maybe sing in the choir, maybe even serve as a deacon or a teacher in the church, a person who gives very regularly, a person who goes on mission trips. You can do all of those things and still be a nominal Christian. Do you realize that? You can still be a Christian in name only. What's the difference between nominal and authentic? An authentic Christian is one through whom the glory of God is revealed. In other words, we're living according to that life that God desires for us. Now, I'm going to give you a much clearer, more detailed definition of authentic Christianity as we see three different characteristics of authentic believers in the passage that we're going to study today. So let's look together at Acts chapter 5, beginning with verse 12. Look at what Luke records for us here about this early church. He says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. 
And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Now, I want to stop you right there, even though I know that that doesn't end with a period, but with a comma. And the reason I want to stop you is because if you look in verse 13 and 14, it almost looks as if Luke is giving us a contradiction, doesn't it? Because he says in verse 13, yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And then in verse 14, oh, but there were a bunch of people who were being added to the Lord. Does it? that sound like a contradiction? What in the world, knowing that it can't be a contradiction, what in the world does Luke mean there with those two verses? You remember last week we studied where Ananias and Sapphira lied about an offering that they were bringing to the church. Remember as the church was experiencing an incredible high, as they were seeing God do incredible things and they were united together in one heart and soul, that they began to see their possessions differently than they had before. They weren't as tied to them as they used to be. They began to see people as more important than possessions. And so as they saw some in their community who had need, some of the people voluntarily, remember it wasn't mandatory, but some of the people voluntarily sold some possessions and gave it to those who were in need. And Ananias and Sapphira saw how people were high-fiving and patting on the backs those who were selling those possessions, and they wanted to get in on that. They wanted the praise of men much more than they wanted the praise of God, and they sold a piece of property or a possession, and they lied about it, remember? They had sold it for a certain price. They had kept back some of the proceeds, which in and of itself was not at all a sin. But when they presented it to the apostles' feet, they presented it as if it were the entire price, which shows us that they were looking for the pat on the back from man. They weren't looking to glorify God. They wanted to be noticed as people who were spiritual in the church. They were more concerned with that. And you remember in the passage we saw last week, God immediately dealt with that sin, and Ananias and Sapphira both died in the presence of the apostles. So, what Luke is telling us here in verse 13, where he says, none of the rest joined them, but the people esteemed them highly, it means that they thought long and hard about calling themselves Christians. Because they recognize that when you take on the name of Christ, there is an accountability that goes along with that. God takes very seriously the difference between nominal Christianity and authentic Christianity. God desires for His name to be revealed for His people, and the people here recognize that, and so they were a little slow to make that decision. Would you say that that's still true today? Or would you say that people don't think quite as much about the fear of God when making a decision for Christ or even making a decision to be a part of a church? Would you agree that sometimes in our day people come to church because it's the right thing to do or because it certainly it looks good, particularly if a person's a business owner, it's good to network and make contacts through people at church? Or even if a person is running for political office, it's good to be seen in church and to be identified with the people of God sometimes with very little fault about what being a Christian actually means. So Luke is pointing out to us that people took that decision very seriously. They were very cautious. However, at the same time, there were people who counted the cost, and many of them still were placing their faith in Jesus. The church was continuing to grow as the church was remaining pure. And look at what happens in verse 15. So that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Here is the first characteristic of authentic Christianity. The power of God is on display through authentic believers. The power of God is on display through authentic believers. 
You see, the community and even surrounding communities were able to see the power of God at work through the church. People were coming to the church in throngs. They weren't coming because they liked the style of music. They weren't coming because of the personality of the preaching of the preacher. They weren't coming because of the nice facilities they had. They weren't coming because of the programs that they offered for their kids or for their students. They were coming because they saw the power of God on display and they were drawn to that power. Would you say people are drawn to the power of God when they look at the church? Now, I want to say a couple of things about what's happening here. Now, remember, this is a transitional period in the life of the church. And so, as you see about people being healed of their sickness and unclean spirits being cast out of folks, sometimes, again, we have that tendency of saying, well, why don't I see that as much today as they did back then? Again, I remind you, they didn't see it as much as you think they did. It's just that you're reading these accounts in the Scripture. However, this transitional period, if the apostles are proclaiming a message that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, how in the world are the people going to know that that's true if Jesus has ascended to heaven and they're not able to physically see him? The only way they're going to be able to authenticate that message is to see the power of Jesus on display through those apostles because they did not have the full New Testament like you and I do to be able to see whether or not what someone is saying is actually true. So it's important to remember this transitional period. Another important thing to remember is this. Ancient people saw illness and being tormented by unclean spirits as indicative of sin. They believed that physical infirmities were always a result of some spiritual infirmity somewhere. Now, you and I know that that's not the case always, right? So here's a question that we have to think through. How do we see the power of God on display today? What would it look like? How would we know that the power of God was at work in the community? Listen, God can certainly still heal, right? He certainly can, so we keep that. But let's think of some other ways. When a person who has been living his life running from Christ makes just a quick turn and all of a sudden repents of his sin and changes all of his old lifestyle and all of his old habits and begins to now surrender his life fully to the Lord, we know that that's the power of God because man can't do that, right? In most cases, man has tried over and over and over again to convince this man that he needs to turn to Jesus, but only God can save. So we know that's the power of God. When you see marriages that are healed, not for the sake of, or not just put together for the sake of keeping the kids happy until they graduate, but when you see marriages that are restored by the power of God, where there's healing that takes place and forgiveness that takes place and restoration and wholeness, you know that's the power of God at work. When a prodigal child returns home, not just because she's out of money, but because she realizes the error of her ways and begins to come home, not just to her parents, but most of all to God. That's the power of God at work. When a person who lived their lives for material pleasures all of a sudden realize that those material things aren't quite as important and that people are more important than possessions, that's the power of God at work. When a person who was addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography or any other thing is set free and released from that addiction, that's the power of God at work. When a person who is been holding a grudge for a long time and had a really hard time forgiving another person, when that person begins to see the light and understand the grace of God on his life and is willing to forgive another, that's the power of God at work. It's what Jesus was telling us in Matthew 5, 16 when he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The last phrase is really important. He does not say, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give you a pat on the back. 
they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Why would you glorify the Father in heaven? Because you recognize that what is impossible with man was made possible with God. So when you see situations around your life or as a church, when we see situations in the community where God is being glorified, where things are being done, not because of the efforts of man, but because of the grace of God, then the power of God is on display through the church. So let me ask you again. For your life, is the power of God seen through you? Does the power of God so fill your life that people just want to be around you because they feel like the blessing of God is right around the corner when you came around the corner? Are you seeing people saved? Are you seeing prayers answered and lives restored? Are you seeing God only type things happening? Or what about the church? Does the church see the power of God on display? Is the church seeing people saved? Is the church seeing marriages restored? Is the church seeing families become whole again? Is the church seeing people enslaved set free? Is the church seeing old grudges be forgiven and healed? With authentic believers, the power of God is on display. Let's move forward. Verse 17. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Listen, I know you're probably like me, and a lot of times you, you, know, you get up in the morning and you do your quiet time, you're reading the scripture, and do you see that sometimes you have a tendency to kind of read through stuff and not get much out of it? It's one of the great things about Sunday, okay? We're going to make you slow down a little bit, all right? So I want you to slow down, and I want you to look... At verse 20 again. These guys are in prison for the second time now for preaching about the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, gosh, can I just tell you how much I love seeing you bow your heads and look at the Bible? That is the most incredible thing in the world as a pastor. If I die today, my life is fulfilled because your head was down in your Bible. Just, I just want to say thank you very much. I just want to say thank you. All right. So, now put your head back down. Right. <laughs> Verse 20. Go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. You can't make that stuff up, okay? Hang with me here. They've been arrested twice for preaching about the resurrection. They're in prison. The angel lets them out. Now, if I am Peter... I am hoping that the message of the angel is, now I am going to transport you to a bed and breakfast on the other side of the world somewhere close to an ocean, right? But that's not what he says. He says, go back into the temple and preach again. He is telling them to go back into the religious leader's home court really wasn't theirs. They just thought it was theirs. I mean, seriously, what he's doing is kind of like last year. Remember Baker Mayfield when he took the flag and he just staked it in the visitor's uh, football field right on top of their logo? That's kind of what he's asking them to do here. And the crazy thing is, they do it. They do it. Here's the second thing about authentic believers. Authentic believers are persistent in God's call. 
persistent in God's call. Now, when I say God's call, I'm not talking about God's call to full-time ministry like God called me to be a pastor, which, again, nothing wrong with that. Maybe you should consider it. But when I say God's call, I mean God's call for your life to be lived bigger than you. God's desire to reveal his name through you, whether you're a banker or you're a teacher or you're a coach or you're a construction worker or you're a full-time mom, whatever it is God's called you to do. God's call on your life is for you to glorify him wherever you are. As a student, it's at school. As an athlete, it's at practice. So wherever God's placed you, it's his call on your life to glorify his name. An authentic believer is persistent in that call. Now, think about how easy it is for you and me to abandon it. We can make, wake up in the morning with a terrible headache, and that's enough to cause us to abandon it. We can face a little resistance from some people at school, and that's enough to abandon it. We can just get a look from folks and maybe kind of wonder if they're thinking we're a little bit weird and that's enough to abandon it. We can get disappointed with somebody or we can get mad at somebody and as a result of that, just kind of drop off the face of the earth and abandon God's call on our lives. It doesn't take much for us to step away from God's call on our lives. But for these apostles, man, they are persistent, aren't they? They've been arrested twice. And now the angel says, go back to the temple court and preach again. And they're crazy enough to go. Why are they crazy enough to go? Because they were authentic. You see, a nominal Christian, a Christian in name only, would never be persistent. Because a nominal Christian is a person who claims to be a Christian for the purpose of the benefit that they receive as a result. But an authentic Christian is a person who has surrendered his life wholly to Christ. All for the benefit of Christ regardless the personal cost. Let's keep going. It gets better. Verse 22. When the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported saying, Man, indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. When the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. That's persistent, isn't it? The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by the way, by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to those things. So also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So when brought in to the religious leaders, the apostles essentially say to them, listen, you do what you think is right, but for us, we ought to obey God rather than men. God's call on our lives is bigger than us. It's to share the message that Jesus of Nazareth, remember whom you had murdered, Jesus of Nazareth went to the cross. He died. He was buried in the tomb. On the third day, he was raised again. He is the prince. He is the savior. God sent him in order to make lives whole. He sent Jesus in order to heal marriages and to bring salvation and to bring prodigals home and to make addicts go free and to help people learn how to forgive as they understand grace. He is the power of God in the flesh. Jesus came. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. He is the Savior. And in Him, people can be saved from their sins and they can be brought to God. And the Holy Spirit, this power that you see in us, is just corroborating everything that we say. Man, they're persistent, aren't they? Why were they so persistent? Why? We said they had we were authentic believers. What made them, though? What made them authentic believers? It goes back to Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, remember, when they said the first time, we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. 
You can have sat in church services and Sunday school classes and Bible school classes, Disciple Now weekends, your entire life where you heard about Jesus, but you never heard Jesus for yourself. Have you heard Jesus speak to you? Have you seen Jesus in your life? Authentic believers are persistent in the call. Now let's wrap up. Verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious. Boy, you bet they were. And they plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. And after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, look at that again. When they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. Look at that again. They departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple... And in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Authentic believers have the power of God on display through their lives. Authentic believers are persistent in God's call on their lives. And authentic believers have poise, one might even say, can praise in the midst of persecution. Have poise, maybe even are willing to praise in the midst of persecution. Okay, now, let's just put the church face off for a second. I'm not your youth Sunday school teacher. I'm not your mama's friend, you know. So it's just me and thee right here, okay? Just us. You look at that passage. You see how those apostles are handling that. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus is just us. Isn't that just a little nuts? Seriously. I mean, in there a part of you that goes, man, what a beautiful story. Boy, how great those apostles are. Forget all that. You and me. Isn't that just a little crazy? Why in the world, why in the world would they continue to preach and teach, continue to be persistent, continue to stand with poise, continue to allow the power of God flow through them? Why would they do that? Because their faith was real. That's why. It was real. They had seen and they had heard Jesus. They were witnesses of the resurrection. By the way, remember, that was a qualification in order to be an apostle. They were witnesses of the resurrection. So having seen him and having heard them for themselves, that carried them through and helped them to live a life that was bigger than themselves. So it comes back to you here now, all right? Are you a nominal Christian? Or are you an authentic one? Because a nominal Christian would have never done this. Would you have? You know, in this chapel that meets right over here, many of you may not know, there's a Chinese congregation that meets over here. It's actually a Baptist church, Starkville Chinese Christian Church. And we've had the incredible privilege of being able to partner with them over the last several years. 
They've just called a pastor who is originally from the mainland, uh, but came over to America and has studied and earned his degree. And his name is Pastor Sun. And this past week, Pastor Sun and I and a couple of other pastors had lunch together, and then we came back to my office and we met together for a little bit. And by the way, this Chinese church, man, I mean, lots of Chinese students that come here to America are introduced to the Chinese church. Also, professors, even visiting professors, come here to the Chinese church. They have the opportunity to hear the gospel, and they are going all over the world. I mean, there's uh, some of the guys who've come through the Chinese church or Chinese pastors here at Chinese churches in America, and some of the visiting professors and people like that have gone and started house churches in China. Right here from Starkville, Mississippi. How incredible is that? But I was meeting with Pastor Sun the other day, and one of the guys that was with me asked him the question. He said, what's the greatest barrier to Chinese students accepting Jesus as Savior? And he answered just as honestly as every answer he always gives, and he said, fear. He said they fear persecution. They fear the possibility that, you know, they may not be able to come over here and study anymore. They fear that they may not be able to have a job when they go back. They fear some of the ramifications that could come upon their families as a result of them placing faith in Jesus. And I listened to that, and we just kind of went on to some other things, but it kind of stayed in my mind. And so towards the end of our time together, I came back to that, and I said, listen, let me ask you. you. You said that the number one reason people from China or students from China the one, number one reason or barrier to them coming to faith in Jesus is because of fear of persecution. I say, what do you say to somebody who's struggling with that fear? And he said, I remind them that it's eternal life. Hmm. Isn't it true that even sometimes we who call ourselves Christian are really more nominal than authentic in that we hold much more tightly to this world than we do to the eternal life that was purchased for us by Jesus on the cross. And can't you see that these apostles who chose to live the eternal life instead of the temporal life, that there was a power that was working through them that was absolutely undeniable and making an incredible difference in their world. By the way, I was reading an article. It was in Time Magazine and other publications. Do you realize that the church in China has been growing at a rate of 10% a year since 1979? I'm not going to wow you with statistics, but I'm just going to let you guess. Do you think the same rate has been happening in America? It is also believed by some researchers that by 2030, there will be more believers in China than there are in any other country in the world. And by the way, China is a hotbed of religious persecution. Why? Is the church in China so powerful? Because it's real. So let's come back again. Those of you who would call yourselves Christians, those of us who would call ourselves Christians, are we nominal Christians? Or are we authentic Christians? What does the evidence around us suggest? Is the power of God dripping through us? Lives being changed as a result of us being here in this community? Are we persistent in God's call in our lives? Are we poised and even willing to praise in the midst of persecution because that's the life God's called us to and we know that eternity is more important than the here and now? Where do we stand? Well, our formula for the year, transform thinking plus intentional actions equals for startful. Your thinking hopefully has been transformed by the word of God this morning. Let me give you a few intentional actions for today. 
okay? Intentional action number one, same as it always is, trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. We believe that you have seen and heard Jesus today because we have shared with you the Word of God. The Word of God never comes back void. You haven't been given a man's opinion. You have been given the Word of God. So as God's Word has gone out before you this morning, it is our desire that the words of the Scripture have just jumped off the page and into your heart, and you have been able to see and hear Jesus maybe today for the first time. And if that's you, in just a moment as we stand and we sing, we'll ask you to come forward and trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Move, maybe some of you, from nominal to authentic. Maybe you are a believer. Maybe you would say, I am a Christian, but there's no question you would say, I'm nominal. Listen, come home, right? Prodigal, come home. Make the transition. Come to authentic faith. Live the life that's bigger than you, that God has always desired in that salvation that He purchased for you. Intentional action number two. Is there some sin in your life that's hindering the power of God flowing through you? Because if we're not seeing the power of God flowing through us, there's a problem, right? Because that's the purpose of salvation. He saved us in order to reveal himself. So if people aren't seeing God through you, and listen, they're not seeing God through you when you say, yeah, I go to First Baptist Orville. They're not seeing God through you when you say, uh, yeah, my wife is in a Bible study up at the church on Wednesday nights, and then I go to a men's fraternity. They're not seeing God through you just because you decide that when you go to this particular function, you're not going to act always the same as everybody else. Unbelievers can do all of those things, right? Do people see the power of God flowing through you? If they're not, there's a problem. Is there sin in your life that's keeping that from happening? See, with the early church, that sin was removed. The power was on display again, right? And then intentional action number three, maybe you are a Christian, but you're not a part of a church. And maybe you've just been floating around, going from church to church to church. And by the way, university students, you're not going to get a pass here. We're not giving you a pass. You're adults. We treat you like adults. We treat you like God wants you to be treated. We're we're not going to just, you know, pat you on the back, let you do what you want to do. Every believer needs to be a part of a church home. Because God is for the church, because God is for Starfall. Maybe God's calling you to be a part of the church today. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning and to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, thank you for revealing just yourself through your word. And God, as we come to this time of invitation, help us to make that decision this morning that you've been leading us to make. In your name we pray, amen. Amen.